Welcome. I'm Ann Cleveland, the Executive Director of the Charleston Library Society, and we are thrilled to have Susan Meisner here this evening and C.J. Lotes, who is going to be in conversation with her. If we have learned anything over the last year, it's that life is fragile. And this book will open doors in your imagination and in history that will be as compelling as I can imagine. Be sure to go to Buxton Books to purchase a, a copy. I can't think of, of a better present to send anybody uh, to sort of di divert them from the news of the day. Instead, give them something enjoyable. We are thrilled to have CJ and I'm gonna turn it over to her because she's going to give you more details on Susan, our wonderful guest. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, and thank you for letting me borrow this beautiful office. The Charleston Library Society, this is not my home office, but there's some historic paintings in here. And if you're in Charleston, you have to visit um, the Charleston Library Society. Um, my name is CJ Lotes. I'm the senior editor at Garden and Gun Magazine here in Charleston. And yesterday I worked on a story about duck decoys. Um, today I was editing a recipe, but my, in all the craziness and the fun of my job, my most favorite thing is interviewing authors, interviewing people who write books. So tonight is a thrill to introduce Susan Meisner, who is a best-selling author of historical fiction. She has more than half a million books in print across 15 languages. And today we'll be talking about her latest, um, The Nature of Fragile Things, which I just finished this book. And I have to say, Susan, I heard historic fiction and I thought interesting, but I didn't expect this to be sort of a thriller. Um, I, I want to start there. I'll give just a little synopsis that there's an immigrant from Ireland named Sophie. She lives in New York. She answers a newspaper advertisement for a husband and packs up her life, moves, moves to San Francisco, and marries a man who turns out to be not exactly what she expected. So however much more you're comfortable telling, uh, we share a little bit more about the plot. That was well done. Very good and very succinct. Yeah, Sophie is living in lower Manhattan in a terrible tenement and she's desperate to leave for a lot of reasons that she does not reveal to the reader right away, but you can tell she wants out of, out of New York in a, in a pretty awful tenement situation. And she's desperate enough to answer that mail order bride ad. And so she uh, comes out West, marries this San Francisco widower who's got this little girl, five years old. Her name is Catherine, but they call her Cat. And at first everything seems like it's fine. And for her, she finally has pretty much everything she's wanted for a pretty long time. Um, she's got a nice house to live in, nice clothes to wear, good food to eat. She's got this little girl to love who doesn't speak, by the way, and that's attributed to the fact that she's grieving the loss of her mother. But Sophie, who knows she can't have children, is convinced she can love that little girl into speaking again. And Sophie's just so happy to be anyone's mother. She thought she was gonna miss out on that completely because you know she can't have children. There's just one little wrinkle in all of this, and that is her new husband, Martin, is there's something up with him and she can't quite put her finger on it. He's, he's nice, he's polite, he's a good provider, but there's something up with him. He travels for his business and that's a little bit weird to her, but there's other things about him too that um, she can tell something's not quite right and not everything is as it seems, but she dismisses it because she has 90% of everything else that she's wanted for a long time. And she's able to dismiss it until the night before the earthquake, the very famous 1906 San Francisco earthquake. And just as her whole world is, is crumbling around her, um, then the whole world itself literally is crumbling. Uh, everything begins to crumble. And I can't tell you more about it because it is a little bit of a mystery, but everything is different for her because again, nothing is as it seems. And you write historic fiction and there's all these layers to it, people in these crisis situations. I'm curious as a writer in your, in your bag of ideas that you, that you keep in your head, are you thinking about settings and historic events first or do you have 
storylines and characters that you want to get across and you fit them, which, which comes first for you? You know, lately, I would say for like the last five or six books of mine, it's always been the event or the location first. Like I'll come across an event in history or a location with a historic um, significance to it. And I'll think, wouldn't that be a great setting for a story? But then what story should I give it? And sometimes I have to think about which characters could would benefit most or which story would benefit most because the characters usually have to go through hell first. But, you know, what story would benefit most from that backdrop? And so with this one, I, I knew I wanted to write a book about the earthquake, partly because I, I live in California. It's my home state. I grew up with earthquakes. And I thought, you know, that's probably a really good backdrop for a story about a person, not a quake, but about a person whose world begins to crumble. And so I thought, well, why? Why is her world crumbling on the very day the world is literally crumbling? And I thought, well, I have to give her a problem. She's got to want something and she's got to not have it. All the things that we authors give to characters at the beginning of a book is they got to want something. It's got to be something that the reader will understand. And it's got to be something that they want it for a good reason. So I began thinking, well, why, why would Sophie this mail order bride be a good candidate to be in a world that's falling apart. So I had to think about what I could do with her to make her own world fall apart. And usually it's a series of questions. Well, what if, what if, what if the man she marries is not the man she thinks he is? Well, if he's not, then what is he? And then I begin asking that question. So it starts with the, it starts with the event. And then I start narrowing and narrowing it down to get the characters. How important is research to what you do and, and how are you doing your research? Research for me is paramount and I guess it's because if someone picks up one of my books and they know it's historical fiction, they know that it's, it's a novel but it's historical which means I want them to be able to trust me that I'm going to take them to the, I'm going to take them back in time to a time that really existed such that no matter if my characters were real or not, the location I take them to in the story is real. And what, happen, what happens to my fictional characters could have easily happened to somebody else because everything around those characters is real. Um, you know, down, down to what happened on the day of the quake and the fire and everything after it and before it, I wanted it to be as accurate as possible. So I usually spend about three or four, five months depending, researching and kind of gathering all the information I'm gonna need to then put fictional people into a real world. And I'm really glad that there's a lot written about the San Francisco earthquake. I was just sharing in the green room earlier, this book by Simon Winchester called A Crack in the Edge of the World. It was a really good book to read. You might be able to get it from the library if you're, if you're interested. Books like this were very helpful to me because they, they were, um, Simon Winchester is very in depth and all of his um, books are well footnoted and noted. So I knew that if he said something that interested me further, I could go to his end notes and then just dig deeper. And there's, there's lots of photographs uh, about, the, about the earthquake and there's uh, newspapers, archived newspapers. Um, San Francisco Library has archived digital versions of the newspaper. So I felt like everything I needed to write this book was there for me. I just had to avail myself of it. You used a word that really stood out to me, trust trust with the writer and the reader. And I'm wondering, you have a background in community journalism. Mm -hmm. um, how does that inform your work and your research and that trust with your audience? That's a good question. You know, I feel like the years, I worked at a newspaper for 10 years and I feel like the, the time I was there, I didn't really realize it was preparing me to write novels because I didn't know that's the transition I was gonna make. Yeah. But it, it, gosh, it really did because we did have to be accurate. Um, and I think it, it prepared me in all kinds of ways to write historical fiction, even though in the beginning I was writing contemporary novels. But when I made this switch in 2008 to historical fiction, I think I did fall back on all of the things I learned as a journalist, you know, to create a, a, a measure, a, not a measure, a whole lot of trust between me and the reader. So you're right, it plays into it quite a lot. We do a lot of fact checking at Garden and Gun. Um, we pride ourselves on, on our fact checking process. And whenever I'm training one of the um, editorial assistants or a, a younger journalist, I say, this might seem tedious or boring to you, but this is the bedrock of what we do is creating that trust with the reader. So we're, if, if you have to call somebody and say, do you really open at that time? Or, you know, and if it seems a little nitpicky, this is, 
the bedrock of what we do. So, so you have to do it. And, and throughout your entire career, you will be fact checking and researching. So learn to love it if you want to yes. stay. <laughs> your readers will appreciate it. That's for sure. <laughs> yes, we hope so. Um, uh, for the research for this book, did you go down any rabbit holes that you could share with us of things that you just totally didn't know about the San Francisco earthquake? Maybe for those of us who don't know too much about it, um, any sort of fascinating rabbit holes? The, the thing that surprised me the most, there were, there were two things actually. And one was when I first began the research and I, all I knew about the quake was what there, that there was one, but I didn't realize that it wasn't the quake so much that was devastating to the city, it was the fire. Because the earthquake happened a little after five in the morning on April 18, most people were asleep. It was big, it was massive. It was um, a little bit bigger than the, uh, the one that was in your neck of the woods in 1886. That one they figure was around, was around 7.6 maybe. This one was 7.9, it was big. And you know, substandard buildings, a lot of those fell right away. Wood frame buildings might've fallen right away, but a great many of San Francisco's buildings they withstood the quake with some damage, but they were still standing. But the gas lines that broke open and the water mains that broke open meant that all kinds of little fires broke out and there was no way to put them out because the fire brigades and then the army that came in to help them could not access water. So before you knew it, there was a wall of flame devouring downtown San Francisco, moving east from, from the east to the west with just this powerful um, force. And so it was the fire that pretty much took out the city, you know, 500 city blocks, 25,000 buildings, 3,000 people dead. That surprised me. The other thing was how fast San Francisco came back from that kind of devastation because nine years after that, they hosted the World's Fair. Wow. So in 1915, less than a decade later, the World's Fair was held there. It was this beautiful um, exhibition. Many, many beautiful buildings were built for it. And they held all kinds of you know, exhibitions and there were galleries and sporting events, everything that people have come to expect from a World's Fair. And people, like 18 million people, came from February to December to not only go to the World's Fair, but to see this phoenix really that had risen from the ashes. So that to me speaks of great determination to come back from that kind of loss to be able to host the World's Fair just nine years later. Wow, you mentioned the, the Charleston earthquake and that was in 1886. And mm -hmm. it sometimes history feels so far away and, and even living in somewhere as beautiful as Charleston where the history is right here, that number seems so, so far away. Um, the office where I work when we're not working from home, um, in the cigar factory, one of the things that when we get we give tours and say, this survived the earthquake. It was built in 1881. And, and that's sort of a touch point for us in Charleston or buildings that survived the earthquake. But other than pointing to the buildings, what are ways that, I mean, you're, you're a master at this, of making history feel present. What are some other ways to sort of contextualize a historic event like that to make it feel relevant to your readers? Mm -hmm. I think the, the best way is for me to be able to transport you. So if I can give you kind of a ticket to the past in the pages of the book, so that when you start reading, you feel like you're there. That to me is like my, one of my main goals is to, is to bring you there so that you not only feel like you there, feel like you're there, but you feel like you're experiencing what the character is experiencing. And I think that helps to keep history alive, really. I mean, great books like Simon Winchester's book and other books like his, they keep the past alive too, but it's historical fiction that actually takes you there. And it's hard for a nonfiction book to do that because it's not about the character. It's not about the, the people really, it's about the event, but a novel is about the character. And so if, if I can do that, if I can bring you to the past and have you live there for a little while and experience it and, and kind of almost learn the same lessons that the people who survived that time had to learn, well, then you emerge out of the book, you're going to be a little bit different. You're going to be a little, a little wiser about the event, surely, but you're also going to maybe discover things about yourself you didn't know, especially if you've had a moment to kind of like step into the shoes of the character, you might find that you're stronger than you thought you were 
or that you might have, be braver than you thought you were because you might have experienced, you know, something that the character did that felt like you were right along with her, you're right, right beside her or him. And it now is part of your experience in a small way. I think I like that word small because I, I noticed that some of the little moments that stuck with me were specific details like the types of dishes that they were using and then what as an Irish immigrant to the United States what she was cooking and mm -hmm. those little sort of food moments that felt so human those were the, the moments that really stood with me and I and I bet even down to that detail you were researching those specifics yes because that's part of a real person's life you know if you're an immigrant living in a new country you bring your history with you it's it's part of your past and it's part of your culture that you that you have inside your soul and so you know I you know my my a lot of my ancestors came from Ireland but a lot of them came from Germany too and so when I was growing up you know my grandmother would make Pennsylvania Dutch dishes all the time and I didn't really know what she meant when she would say oh this is a Pennsylvania Dutch dish but you know, now I, I get it. It was because it, these were recipes that all of my German ancestors brought with them when they settled in Pennsylvania. And um, and I think that's that's part of, of dialing into a character's real life, like to make a character feel like they've got flesh and blood is they they have a, a past. They have a beginning. You don't you don't start the book on page one of a person's life. You know, I start it in Sophie's 21st year. So she's got 20, 21 years of personality to bring to the page. And part of it would be the, you know, the dishes that she grew up with. And she's not sugary sweet, you know, she's complicated. And I, I, I was wondering about that as, as a choice, you know, some of the characters are a little more straight down the road, sweet, um, you know, Belinda's a little more straight laced. How do you choose kind of who gets a little darker tinge and mm. and how to make how to sort of complicate and fuss up your characters a little bit? Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Well, I even though I invent all of these people, so they're probably going to have a little bit of me in all of them. I don't want them all to feel like me or for all of my characters and all of my books to feel like they're the same person, just in a different story. So what I do to give each character their own kind of persona especially one that might be different than my own or the character right next to them is to, um, I, I, I give them the Enneagram test. <laughs> I really? will, yeah. So I will take the test as if I'm Sophie and I've thought about her, you know, I thought about what she's like and what she's been through and what she's decided to do and all of that. And I know things about her that the reader won't know until they're done with the book. And so I take the test as if I'm Sophie and she should get a different number than me because I'm a two and I know what twos are like. You know, twos are very sympathetic. Twos are like Belinda. Twos are people pleasers. Twos um, want to make sure everybody's taken well care of. Sophie is not a two. So if I give her the test and out pops two for a number, I know I haven't, I, I don't know her yet. I'll, I'll take it again until I figured out, okay, I know who she is. She's like a five. So then I'm not a five. I really don't know how to five thinks but I can go to all kinds of blog results about how a five thinks and that's all right there. So if I'm writing a scene with Sophie and I know she's not a two like me, she's a five. And if she's about to do something, I'm thinking, I don't know what she would do. I just go to the list of all the traits of an Enneagram five, because even though there's a lot of, there's nobody who's exactly one thing, it's kind of stereotypical, but still these are traits of a typical five. And if she's a five, there are things she's gonna do and things she's not gonna do based on her personality. So it allows me to um, create a person like Sophie who's not like me and give her choices and decisions and reactions and actions that would be different than my own. This is juicy advice for aspiring writers out there. This is this is a free event. We're getting some good <laughs> advice here. Well, the cool thing about the Enneagram test is there are free versions available. And if you haven't taken it for yourself, it's fun. Even if you don't put a lot of stock in personality tests, they're very, I think they're fun and they do reveal because I've taken the free test, several different free tests, several times. And I always come with a two, always two wing. I'm a two wing three every single time. So I think there's some science to it. There's something accurate about it. And now that I know what I'm like, um, I know what my weaknesses are and I know what my strengths are. And so does my husband. So, cause my husband's not a two and I, and, you know, I know what he is now. He's more like a five. And so we understand each other better. And 
for that reason, it helps me understand my characters better. Um, it's funny that you mentioned husbands and wives. That's a pretty fascinating dynamic in this um, in this book. Any any further commentary there on on that dynamic in the book? Well, you know, she's a mail order bride. She makes a decision I don't think I would ever make. Um, but you know, I don't I don't know what it was like to live back when women had little agency. You know, she's she's a woman in the twenty early twentieth century. She can't even have her own bank account. And you know, she, you, you can tell she wants out of New York and she could go home to Ireland, but she does not. She goes as far west as she can go. And so she's gotta be pretty desperate to marry a man she does not know. He's very handsome. I have a picture of what he looks like in my head. This is what he looks like in my head. So even though he's a very handsome man and he's got a nice house and all of that, she's still taking a tremendous risk, in my opinion. I don't think I would be able to do it, but you have to think about what it was like to be an unmarried woman at the turn of the century, um, you, you pretty much, um, you didn't have a lot of um, freedom to do anything. So, you know, marrying somebody for the convenience or for the position was probably more common than we think. In fact, it probably explains why there's a lot of mail order brides during the westward expansion, because there are a lot of women who wanted to be married and they weren't having those opportunities in the East. And in the West, where there were exponentially more men than women, they, they wanted wives and children. They wanted the normal life. And so they made these transactions that were, um, you know, very different than eHarmony. You know, they weren't looking for a relationship. You know, they were looking for stability and companionship and children and, you know, help. And so, um, you know, I think for marriage for Sophie meant a little something different than it would to somebody who goes on a, on a, a dating website these days. And you have a picture of Sophie too, of how you imagine. Yes, I do. This is how I see her in my head. I have no idea who this person really is, but I went on a image search because it helps me think when I'm writing, if I can see an image of, um, of these people that I've imagined, they, they, they start to take on a little more um, flesh and bone in my head. And here's the little girl that, that Sophie ends up um, wanting to love. So um, Martin has this little girl named Kat, the one who doesn't speak. And she also has a role to play in this book. And, and part of the book is a, um, there's an overarching theme of mother love because Sophie loves that little girl. And so when things start to crumble, her, her goal is, um, the only thing that really matters to her is protecting that child mm -hmm. that she's only known for a year. Motherly love and female friendship really stood out to me mm -hmm. as well. Um, the strength of, uh, in, in just unbelievable circumstances, the power of a of, of really strong friendship. Um, that really resonated with me. I'm glad to hear that. That was something that was intentional on my part. I really wanted a book about female solidarity. And I kind of took my cues from, actually it's a contemporary novel, it's not historical fiction, but Leon Moriarty wrote Big Little Lies. Mm -hmm. And you know that's a story about women coming together um, who, who kind of need each other in a tough moment. And I also liked how the HBO adaptation of that wonderful book began with police interviews. And I, that's why I utilize the same thing with this book is this book opens, The Nature of Fragile Things opens with a police interview. It, it's the transcript of an interview with Sophie seven months after the earthquake because her husband is missing and he's been missing since the earthquake. And so they're, they're trying to find him and she's come in to help them find her husband. And so that's why we have the, these, um, these scenes where we spend a little bit of time with those transcripts and then we're back in the, in the, you know, the time of, of the earthquake itself. So I, I kind of borrowed that idea that a story of female solidarity feels good to read and this idea that it's cool to begin with police interviews. What does that do using those different structures where you've got the straight narrative, police interviews, what does that allow you as the writer to do? For me, I like, I like variety in my construction. I, I feel like the reader likes it too. I don't want to start every book out the same. So to start out with a, a police a transcript, it's not even the interview in story form. It's, it's a transcript. There's a lot going behind the scenes that you don't see. So it's, it's up to the reader when you're looking at a transcript is you don't see the body language. You know, you can only, you can only wonder, well, we, we don't really know Sophie yet. So what is she thinking? And then as the story builds 
and you get to know her better. Then when we flash over to the transcript time, well, Val, you know her now. You're knowing her more and more the more you read. And so for, for this particular book, this kind of construction, I think, um, helped, it helped give some framework to Sophie that the reader got to enjoy in, in, like, in like servings. Right, absolutely. You mentioned um, that you like it when your books have a, a note of encouragement or, or kind of help people believe that they can overcome things. And I'm wondering if there's someone who early on encouraged you in your life or anyone that you could mention that has encouraged you. Oh, gosh. There are so many people that um, I've been uh, privileged to know in my life. I, I don't even know if I could, um, I'm not even sure if I could name one. I can say that my um, um, freshman in high school um, English teacher, so a ninth grade English teacher, um, he um, affirmed me as a writer way back before I knew I was one. Like I would turn in things for him and he would um, give them back to me with usually a nice grade, which was very, which was very nice and always had all kinds of comments uh, affirming me as a writer. And I didn't even know that's what I was going to do with my life. When I did love to write, I knew that, but I thought of it as a hobby and I thought, oh, it's always going to be a hobby. But he was the one that kind of made me think that, no, it might be something more for you. And um, I didn't really pay attention to that because I, I didn't become a writer. I didn't major in writing or journalism, but I came back to his encouragement many times over the years when I was thinking, you know, I've got this itch to write a novel and I, but I don't know if I can. And I would remember his encouraging words. It took me until I was 42 years old <laughs> to write my first novel, but it's really because I had that encouragement from him. And I appreciate it so much. I dedicated A Fall of Marigolds to him. He's still alive. He just celebrated his 93rd birthday. And during non-COVID times, we get together for coffee a couple of times a year because he only lives half an hour away from me. We, we reconnected after I moved back to San Diego. So I would say he, he, was, he was the one that encouraged me to make my writing something wonderful. And for, for me, for writing to be wonderful, it should leave the reader feeling wonderful. So it's important to me to leave not on a um, happily ever after note, but a satisfying note. I want you to feel like when you've finished one of my books and you close the page, that you feel good that you spent those hours with me. You know, you probably had to give me eight or nine hours of your life and you trusted me with those hours. And I don't want you to feel like, oh my gosh, I feel terrible. <laughs> I want you to feel good either about yourself or about life in general or about humanity or about the fact that uh, we can always become better versions of ourselves than we are. You know, we can always move forward. And so um, for that reason, my books will, my books, I want them to end on a satisfying note. So it's important to me that that, that happens. I will say I was, you know, kind of doing that thing where you're kind of looking, thinking, how is she going to wrap this up? with 20 pages left, is there gonna be a sort of res, I was wondering how that was gonna happen. And I was surprised at, I was surprised at some of the specifics of the ending um, and, and who kind of starred in the ending. Um, yes. That was really powerful to me and, and, and surprised me completely. I'm glad, that's good. Um, is there anything else sort of about the Charleston earthquake or the San Francisco earthquake that you learned in your research that you want readers to be sure to know about you know we've got a Charleston audience here did sure. a little research sure well it was really puzzling to me about the Charleston earthquakes I couldn't understand it I didn't understand how there could how there could be one there when you're so far away from a, a major fault line like, right. like we are here in California and the reason why there's this little joke that one day Southern California will fall into the ocean is because because we are, California is on a fault line and it's a pretty big one. And the San Andreas Fault, which I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's pretty famous out here. It's pretty big. It's, it's the reason why San Francisco had that earthquake. Um, it travels from the, the beginning of California pretty much all the way south to where I am. But as it travels, it moves inland. So by the time it gets to where I am, it's way inland and I'm over here on the coast. So all of coastal Southern California is on the Pacific plate. It's on a different tectonic plate. We're in the water one. <laughs> so we're, uh, we, are, we are on top of the, of the Pacific plate, which is mostly underwater. And then, then the rest of the nation, including South Carolina is on the North American plate. 
And so that's why there's this joke that one day we'll fall in the ocean, because if there is a big one here, we're on the wrong side <laughs> of those two boundaries. But the, um, the, the Charleston quake, because there's no boundary line there, it's, it's a weakness in the North American plate. And they're not even plates, they're gigantic chunks of land. And um, at, at the thickest, it's 185 miles thick at the thickest point. Wow. So the fact that there was even an earthquake in, in Charleston was just amazing to me. And it was big, it was, it was huge. It was, um, you know, like I said, uh, upwards of past seven and a half on the Richter scale. It was felt as far away as Boston and wow. as far south as Cuba. And yeah, a hundred people died. And um, I think it was $5 million in damages and $1,886, which would be astronomical now. So it was, it, was, it was quite the thing. And I'm glad there hasn't been one since and perhaps there won't be another one quite like it. And in the write up to this event, you know, it's mentioned that your, your books are timely in some ways. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, how, of course, in many ways, but how much do you consider the timeliness of the moment? You know, we're seeing such extreme weather and all that. Are you thinking about that as you're thinking about what book you want to do next? Or does that just sort of happen um, in that way? That's a great question. I think I come by it with a, just a, it's probably not even something I'm aware of, but just this knowledge in the back of my mind that there are certain things about us that do not change. So there are certain things about us as humans that are, I would say, timeless, and we carry them with us generation to generation to generation. And because we have always had to um, weather tough situations, war, disaster, illness, pandemics, all of these things are cyclical, unfortunately. So everything we're experiencing now has been experienced before. And and so this idea that we've got to find a way to hold on to who we are, you know, you've got to find a way to hold on to your humanity in a tough time. And so, um, you know, we, that, that to me is a, is a timeless truth that, you know, you have to find a way to hold on to your humanity, hold on to goodness, hold on to love. You know, those are the virtues that not only will get you through the tough time, but you sure want to have them when you emerge out of it. Yeah. And then mother love is timeless to me. The solidarity of friendship is a timeless um, thing to me. And, um, you know, so is um, like the book I'm writing now, which doesn't have to do with a natural disaster or a war, but it has to do with how we think about each other and how we tend to judge each other when we don't even know each other and how some, some people like to put value on someone else and they're not in any place to do that. And that's also, unfortunately, is something that we see, you know, generation to generation, you know, is, is prejudice. And so... I feel like I, I land on an event, I start to write about it, and I realize, oh, this is not the first time we've been down this road, you know? And so I, I find that the same, the same things that we struggled with, like during the, the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, when I wrote about that, we weren't even in our own yet. You know, little did we know a year later we would be. But I'm finding now, as we're going through our own, that a lot of it was the same the same fear, the same insecurity, the same desire to um, hold on to the people that you love, all of that seems to be the same. So the fact that I've chosen an event that's, that's relevant to the times, I think is almost incidental in a nice kind of way. Totally. I, there's an interesting article, I think in New York Magazine maybe, about this sort of pressure that maybe audiences and critics put on art to sort of have the hot take on whatever the current thing is, and 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 what about you know art for art's sake, and and letting authors explore kind of what's in their mind, or or an older event, and maybe not everything has to be a comment on true something of the moment. Like if we if we put those sort of demands on art, we've sort of said what it has to be instead of yeah. letting it be the thing that it is. And and I don't know. I don't know if I have a fully formed opinion on that, but it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. That actually makes sense to me. And I think too that, you know, we writers, we have to write our books well in advance. You know, I, it takes me a year to write a book and then it takes a year for it to get published. And so a lot of times, you know, the news of the day is something different, you know, two years or three years later. So I think what happens really is we bring to our reading of a book 
the moment that we're in. So it's really the reader that starts to feel like they're um, that the meaning of the book is is arising from their own experience at that moment. Um, you know, you know, because you know, because they're they're related. Because in your mind, you're stringing them together. You're dovetailing them together because you're experiencing something and you're reading something and you begin to see parallels where maybe the reader wasn't even planning on it, but you, the, the reader are experiencing that art with your own, you know, you, you bring to the reading of a book, your own experiences and your own experience at the moment. That's an interesting part of it as well. How much do you think about um, consuming and what you consume while you're in your sort of creative process? How much are you, um, do you ever like say, okay, no more social media or no more TV or tell me about your relationship with consuming other people's creative mm -hmm. work versus your own output. I tend not to deny myself any connection to humanity when I'm writing. because I feel like I want to stay connected to the world. So what I do is I just uh, allow myself to binge a little on Instagram or Facebook or a podcast when I've gotten my word count in because I at the end of the day I still need to write a book but I don't want to feel like I can't engage at all with the world I'm living in I feel like that's probably counterintuitive to a writer so I, I do stay connected but I'm disciplined I've, I've had to learn how to be disciplined and I also continue to keep reading I I, I love books I always have so I'm I'm still reading while I'm writing but I save my reading for the um, for the end of the day and I'm not reading research so much when I'm writing. I feel like the research happened before. So I read for pleasure at, at night at the end of the day, but I also read the good stuff. I, I feel like I don't have time for fluff. So I don't read, I don't read casual things like just silly things. Um, I feel like if I'm gonna, since there are so many books and we don't have time to read, nobody has time to read all the books there are. Yep. I just choose, I just choose books that I feel like um, are going to be memorable and they're also going to speak into my craft because I don't want to read a book that was just okay because what if I start to write that way? You know what I mean? So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm careful about what I read and even when I watch things like I've just gotten to have such a high bar for writing on on what, what I watch on the screen that I just can't watch network television anymore because I just find the writing just not quite, it's just not quite enough for me. So we end up, you know, watching what I feel like are good shows on Netflix and HBO and Amazon Prime that I feel like where well, the writing has to be really good. And I think it's because for me, I feel like I'm ingesting everything I'm watching and reading and it's gonna show up in my writing. So it better be good. Anything to call out recently that you've really enjoyed TV show or or book? Um, I just finished not too long ago The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, which is the most um, it's the most satisfying book I've read in a long time. It might be a little too much for some people because it's about a woman, a desperate woman who makes a deal with a dark deity to get out of an arranged marriage. And, but it's masterfully written. So it's very, very well done. I, I recommend it. Um, if, if you don't mind that kind of premise, it's very good. And then um, coming up soon, like next month is Kate Quinn's The Rose Code. Historical fiction, it's Kate Quinn at her best. I highly recommend it. And then for shows, I, I guess the show that I've watched most recently that I thought this is really good would be The Queen's Gambit, which I watched in December, and but it's I still remember it. Like when people say, "What have you watched recently?" I can't remember what I watched recently, but I remember that show. You know, it because it was so well done. And so I think I think shows like that that they don't have to be cerebral, but they have to be just written really well and and memorable. Because you know, if a show if I can't remember a week later what it was, that says something about the writing, I think. Whereas The Queen's Gambit, which I watched almost three months ago, I can still remember. Do you ever find yourself, um, I, I'm asking this because I know I do this, where I'm like, I'm in stories and words so much. Now I have to go for a walk or now I have to cook something. What are some of those sort of, okay, get out of my, my thinking brain right now. What are some of those things for you? I do like to cook. I do. And I have like a, a shelf full of cookbooks in my um, laundry room that I'm always pulling out. And I sometimes I'll watch a cooking show 
and I, I, I enjoy cooking very much because it's also a creative form. But the thing about cooking is it's, you get it done really fast. <laughs> it doesn't take a year to make dinner. And so, so it takes a year to write a book. You know, I can make something fun to eat for dinner in like an hour or less than an hour. That's very satisfying. And also um, outside, like in the, in the, in the garden, if you call it, we don't really have a garden garden, but we have a, we have some land and there's a lot of weeds. And so even just the act of pulling weeds and, and, and letting there be room for pretty things to grow is, is good for me. And it helps me kind of reconnect with just my own, my life outside of the book. So I would say, yeah, being outside and then cooking are two big ones for me. Before I turn it over to audience questions, are there, um, is there anything about the book that I'm not sort of getting at with my questions that you want to be sure that readers know um, that is sort of a takeaway? Well, that's a great question. You've got some really good questions. I, I may not be able to think of anything for your reader. Um, I would say that, um, and this is just kind of a warning, don't read the book discussion questions. <laughs> There's going to be some really nice book discussion questions on my website. I don't think they're there yet, but they're going to be. Don't read them until you finish the book, just because it is a bit of a mystery and things are going to be revealed to you in kind of a fun way. I think it's revealed to you in kind of a fun way. I wouldn't want that to, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want it to spoil um, the experience for you. So don't read the discussion questions before you finish the book. Okay. Well, I hope that there are some good audience questions. I think Dutch is going to let us know if there are any. Yes, uh, thank you, CJ. Uh, that was wonderful. Susan, thank you as well. Uh, so we do have some questions coming in. Um, so the first one that I wanna to touch on um, is, Susan, could you just go a little bit more into the Enneagram test? Um, we, have, we, it's, we have the audiences intrigued. Sure, well, um, there are several different free versions on the internet. So if you go into your Google search engine or any search engine and type in free, Enneagram test, you'll probably get it, uh, several different um, results. And I don't think it matters which one you take because I've taken several. And, and what it does is it just asks you a series of questions. Um, I don't, can't remember how many there are, but it's not a lot. But it asks you questions like, um, if you are afraid, you are more prone to clam up or get loud. And, and you just you know click the answer that's more true to you. And it, so it asks you a series of, of reaction questions. And when you're done, it gives you a, a result. And there are nine numbers, one through nine. And most people fall within one of them more than another. Some people will take the test and they've got, it's an even, it's an even thing. Um, but it could be that it's four and five, which are semi close to each other as far as results. And so once you get your result, um, a lot of people have just one number it's predominant, like you might be a six um, or you might be a seven and sevens are like make decisions on the fly. They're very easygoing people. Sevens are wonderful friends, um, um, but a lot of people are one number plus a side number. So I'm a two wing three. And that just means I'm mostly two, but I've got some three also. And um, so there, when you get your result and you're wondering, well, I don't know what I am now, all you have to do is, is you can just Google what is a two wing three and you'll get all kinds of people telling you what a two wing three is like. Perfect. Uh, so that makes me think, you, you talk, talking uh, with CJ, you mentioned that um, some things just don't change no matter how long it's been. Um, and so then you also talked about the character diversity of doing the Enneagram and, and figuring out what, what is this character? What's their personality? Um, and so I, I was imagining that probably in your writing repertoire, you've, you've had the numbers come up, right? So you, you've had these different personalities. What, what, did, what personality do you find the most difficult to write as or to write for? Um, or is there a, a, a type of person that you haven't tackled yet that you'd be excited to? I don't think I'm afraid of tackling any of the other personalities. I do want to get it right. And I think the farther I am away from the kind of person I am, the harder it is for me to kind of tap in to um, the motivations of somebody who's just so polar from how I am, but I'm not afraid to give it a try. But I, but it's more important to me that there um, that the character wants something, and 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 why they want it. So I'm I, that scares me more than picking 
a personality type is, will I be able to give them a character quest and a reason to want it that's compelling? Like, are readers going to care about it? They have have to care about um, it. It doesn't matter if an Enneagram one or a nine, but what do they want and why do they want it? That's what I worry about most because I feel like that's that's what's going to keep the character, uh, the, the reader turning pages is um, they want to know if the character is going to get what they want. Wonderful. And that actually leads into this, our next question we have, because um, that's great advice for a writer. And so uh, our one, one patron says, there are threads of a novel in my head, but I've never written one. What resources can you point a person to in order to get started? Well, that's a great question. Um, let's see. I, I've read a couple of books that have helped me kind of figure out um, how to plot a novel. And one of them is, it's called Writing the Breakout Novel by Donald Moss, M-A-A-S-S, -S, Writing, Writing the Breakout Novel. And um, you don't have to want to write a breakout novel, but if you read that book, it just shows you what a breakout novel is like. And a breakout novel has characters who want something that they don't have and great motivations for why they want it and believable obstacles about why they don't have it. And then a quest with twists and turns that add tension because every good book has to have tension or you lose interest. And that particular book will show you how to do that. So you don't have to want to write the breakout novel, but it will show you what is pretty common with all novels that break out is they, they have all of those same kind of characteristics. Awesome. I, so I, my next question has to do with the cover of your book. And then, so it's this conversation that uh, a, a few coworkers and myself have been having um, about just publication in general in, in the past few years and kind of the art of book covers. Um, so could you just maybe go into kind of the process that um, came came to be to decide on the, the final font or the coloring or the sure. how, it, how it happened? Well, when I turn in a book, I, I'm usually asked by the art department, do you have any ideas for the cover? And I usually don't, because I, I can't think like a graphic artist. I wish I could. I, I can tell them, well, here are other covers of other books that I like. And that's about all I'm able to, to add to the conversation. Other authors might have a better vision for their covers. I, I wish I could think that way, but I don't. So the designer at Berkeley who designs my covers, I think she gets me. I think she's read enough of my books that she's she's dialed into my, my mood and what, what type of reader wants my kind of book. And so we've been trying you know, different types of fonts and they've decided on, on the one here that you see here behind the Nature of Fragile Things and the last year of the war, which is one before that. And this, you'll probably see those fonts from now on. They, they weren't always my font, but we've kind of figured it out now. So there's that look. And then there's like the photograph behind it is usually um, historical in nature because you know, we want the, the consumer to know what kind of book they're getting. They're getting a book set in the past. So that communicates that. And then we usually like to have at least one human element on the cover of my books. Some of them haven't had that and they've gone back and redesigned them so that they do. Like The Fall of Marigolds, which is one of mine, did not have a human on the cover. I love that cover, but they felt after time, after working with me for several years, okay, that, that book really needs to have someone on the front. And so they redesigned it. And so all of that goes into play when they're deciding um, for one of my books. As far as color, I think the um, graphic artist, she kind of picks up on the mood and, and, and um, we don't want to convey that a book is somber or anything, but we want people to know, um, are, are you going to feel like you're, um, you're reading a, a thriller yeah. <laughs> or are you reading something that's more contemplative? And so, you know, my, you know, this, this blue that you see for nature of fragile things, I think it suggests that it's going to be, um, it's going to be, a, a, you're going to enjoy it because it's a very nice palette, but it might, it's going to move at a pace that's not like bam, 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 but a bit more of a slow tug at, yeah. at you. It ha it has that uh, that shade of mystery in it, which is yes. it it it's successful, and I think what what you sought after, which is it's a beautiful thing, and I I gotta commend you and congratulate you on getting a, a font that feels like you as a writer. That's I was gonna say you've really made it when you've got a font. That's you a new takeaway for me. So. <laughs> Life goals right here. Susan has, un has unlocked. Yeah. Well, if you look at some of your favorite authors, you'll see that they, they've got a font too. Like once you've kind of settled into a, a look, a brand, well then 
the book people want your readers to find you. And so if they, if they see the font of, oh, that's probably a Susan Meisner book, you know? Yeah. And so most, most writers you'll see, they, they kind of settle into a font because they want the, the, the publisher wants the consumer to make that connection. Well, that, to me, that just means it's your, your craft is so well respected and it's, it just means more good things are coming, which is exciting. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. So, so we have one more question. And so a, a writer once told me that um, some authors don't actually have control over the title of their novels. Um, have you found that to be true? Yes, that is true. Um, the title is usually a conversation that you have with everybody on your team. And it's actually a good conversation to have. I know some people feel really protective of the, of the title they come up with. And it's a sad day for them when they find out they can't have it. But I've learned to trust my publishing team. What they want is what I want. And that is for the book to get to as many readers as possible. So for example, I wrote a book about the Spanish flu pandemic and it was called Under the Canopy of Heaven. And I loved that title because it was lifted from a quote about the pervasiveness of the Spanish flu pandemic. It was everywhere. There was nowhere under the canopy of heaven where you wouldn't find it. And so I lifted that and put it for the title. And marketing, when they got a hold of it, said, no, that won't sell a book about Spanish flu. They were right. I hated to let it go because I really liked it. But they came up with As Bright as Heaven after we talked. And we were all in on that conversation. It made sense. I trusted them. It was the right call. Now, this one, The Nature of Fragile Things, I came up with it early because it fit for a lot of reasons, many different reasons. And I just hoped that they would like it. And I was all prepared to defend it if I needed <laughs> <laughs> to tell them, no, here's why I think my readers will like it, because that's what they want to know. Will your readers buy this book and will new readers want to? And I, but I didn't have to. They liked it. They, they felt it was the right title. But anybody who's a writer out there who worries about having to not, you know, like, like losing the title that you've worked so hard for is your, your publisher wants only good things for you and your book. And if they feel your title won't sell, they know a little more about selling books than you do because you're a writer. So I would say, don't worry about that so much, but you know, try, try to work with them to find one that you all like. That's awesome. That, uh, so Susan, I just want to thank you for your time that you spent with us tonight. This has been really wonderful. It's, it's zooming in from San Diego. Uh, and CJ, I want to thank you as well. Uh, that like, like we both mentioned, you had wonderful questions and, and Susan, you had even better answers. So uh, I congratulate Thanks. you on this recent publication and I, I encourage everyone to go out to their local bookstore. We, we recommend Bucks and Books and buy yourself a copy. Um, and it's, and it's going to be a good thing to come from Ms. Meisner, who has her own font now. So we know what to look for in the future. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was my pleasure. It was a lot of fun. You guys had great questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. everybody have a good night. Thanks. Thanks, CJ. Bye. Nice to meet you. Yep.